How's it going everyone? Rory McKiernan here and welcome to this video episode of the Love and Courage podcast. It's also available as an audio uh, podcast on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, all of those places. It's available for free for all to listen to, as is the archive of great interviews from over the years from the Love and Courage podcast. I want to say a big thanks to everybody who has supported the podcast, whatever way you can or have done, whether it be sharing or chipping in, and a special thanks to all who have chipped in either on a once-off or on a monthly basis. And I'm going to be showing across the bottom of the screen in a few minutes uh, some of the donors' names. A big thanks to all of you donors who've supported in all different ways. And I want to say a big thanks to everybody who supported the launch also of my book, Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. I've been getting a great response from readers and reviewers from all around the world. So big thanks for that. And it's available now uh, from most bookstores and online retailers. It's also available as an ebook and an audiobook. You can find out more at hitchingforhope.com. And if you had read, have read it and enjoyed it, please do help spread the word. You can leave a review on Amazon, Goodreads, Google Books, or tell your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, whatever it is, all the support matters and is appreciated. Now, back to this podcast and this episode, my guest is Ibrahim Halawa, and he's a 25-year-old law student from Tala in Dublin here in Ireland. And between the ages of 17 and 21, he was wrongfully imprisoned in an Egyptian prison after being arrested during a family visit to Cairo. The trip coincided with pro-democracy protests which had swept the country and led to hundreds of civilians being killed by the forces of the military-led government of General El Sisi. And Ibrahim at the time was an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. Uh, I was involved in campaigning at the time to free Ibrahim from prison. And it's great now to finally get a chance to talk with him about his experiences, his insights, and his incredible, harrowing, but also inspirational story. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ibrahim. And please do spread the word if you enjoy it. And thanks for all your support. Thanks for tuning in to the Love and Courage podcast. Thank you, folks. Ibrahim, thanks so much for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been long overdue and I'm finally glad that we can do this now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, how time goes, isn't it? Like I, we've been in touch over the years and um, I was just checking through some old emails and saw like a lot of campaign related emails to when you were in prison going back five years and, and so. And, you know, I, it just really caught me in the moment to think that how time has flown by. Do you have a sense of that yourself? To be honest, I obviously do because I'm comparing the both sides of time um, where, you know, I used to always write when I was inside, I used to always write that time was your worst enemy. Um, but, you know, since ever being released, time has gone by so fast and I'm just like, you know, slow, slow down, slow down. I still want to catch up on life. Like I, you know, it's been going so slow when I was inside, but I'm still glad that I'm on the other side living every moment. And, you know, it's difficult times that we're living in and there's a global pandemic and it's, it's not easy for everyone. It's not easy for me. It's triggering a lot of emotions, but yet again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad and I, I have to appreciate every moment. So you strike me as somebody that has a perspective of gratitude in your life, you know, and that's one of the reasons I was curious to talk to you because obviously most or many people who have been through something similar to you wouldn't necessarily be sitting here with a smile on their face, you know, embracing life. Like, like it's very hard to, I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that you've overcome, but, but yeah. certainly you strike me as someone who's been able to process or manage or, can you give me a bit more insight yeah, into that? Definitely. Um, well, to be honest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be straight up honest. Like, it wasn't easy for me. I I came out of prison and I was expecting one thing. Um, and if I'll be honest with you, it wasn't like I expected it at all. I did not, you know, I wasn't prepared for the media. I wasn't prepared to go out. I just wanted to go out and continue my normal life that was on pause. Um, but there's many aspects that happen um, when you're first released is that you constantly think that, life will continue from where you you stopped off because you know when you're in prison these are the only memories that you have created of life outside so you link everything back to those memories but when i was released 
it was not the same and that's where i kind of got a shock at, at the start and i had to overcome that and process all of that with the media and process all of that with moving on with life you know i was a child and there there i am next i'm expected to get my college degree work a job become a man in, in less than one year which was it was overwhelming and it was very scary but you know there's there's nothing to kind of waste time on and start worrying and start dwelling over it there's no time in life to do that and i, I am grateful and I, and I have a lot of gratitude because you know there's still people in there there's still people in worse conditions there's still people suffering daily in their own life but i'm happy and i always will remain happy because i always say to my sisters like when they have problems i was like you know just think that it could always be worse but also deal with your problem don't ignore it and that that's where i started off with my i started to deal off with my problem once i discovered that you know i have a problem and that was step number one you know i needed to discover that there's something not right here and that i need to get my life straight and i done that slowly but surely but i got there in the end hopefully let's like you said you never overcome i won't i won't lie to you and say you know it's over it's done with no that's that's a lie it doesn't happen like that you know it's triggering and like we were just saying that it's today's you know is the day that all the events started um taking place in egypt in 2013 and it's triggering a lot of memories and that will constantly happen but it's not you know it's not ignoring them it's learning how to deal with them learning how to overcome them and that's 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 what I that's what I believe in a hundred percent. Do you have a sense that prison taught you some of this about how to survive? <sighs> to be honest, definitely. I I was like I was I was a free man. I was such a you know I was such a youngster who never like like any other youngster who never liked to stay at home. I like to go now. I like to move. I like advocating. Even before um you know before prison, I always said that I was never going to get an office job ever. I can't stay. I can't stay in one place. I need to move. I need to speak to people. I need to meet new people. But here I am working an office job now, and you know, life moves on and studying, and you, you expect things. And prison definitely taught me a lot of lessons that I never expected that I would have one day. Um, but one of the things definitely I think it clicked in my mind was to be grateful for the little things and to be grateful with family time and to spend, you know, and and it's okay sometimes to cancel on your best friends to spend. Uh, time with your family you know sometimes we feel that oh they might not call us again we might not go out with them again they might leave us don't worry about your friends worry about your family because these are the people that stick with you by the end of the day mm. these are the people that you know like i said my sisters i think everyone re realized what great job my sisters have done protesting yeah. daily um and i'm very grateful for them and like to be honest the least i can do is kind of stick back home and stay with them yeah, I, I remember being in touch with your sisters, and I think they went on to receive uh, some sort of national award for a campaign. Yeah, didn't? yeah, the woman, the woman, the woman, Irish Tatler Women's Award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. very proud of them, to be honest. I was still like, the, it was such a, it was such a great timing because I was only released as well. Um, so it was great to be there and witness that myself. Like, definitely, it would have been great to get the news if I, if I was inside that you know my, they've achieved such a thing because they deserve it. But being there in the moment was totally different mm. than it's a memory that i will hold forever so so some people watching or listening to this uh we're, we're going to be putting this out as a video and audio but can, can you talk to the listeners who maybe don't know your backstory and and some of how how you ended up in egypt and how you ended up in prison and, and what, what your whole family situation and your your background and that kind of thing yeah definitely so i was born and raised in in ireland uh fair house um you know i was like i was a Tala boy, um, so so I was born and bred here. But um, I, you know, I always say this that I was always taught to stand up for human rights. You know, we're we're Ireland has history for standing up for their own rights. It's and it's been so recent. So we've always been listening to it. It's always been in the back of our, our minds. Um, but when I put what I've learned into practice, some somehow it was you know it was a big crime for me. Um, with all what people were saying, but I was only, I was only 13 and I don't regret anything, anything that I've done because, uh, sorry, it was in 2013, I was only 17. Um, but I was still, I was still a young lad and I went to Egypt for my summer holidays and it was, um, just right after my leave insert. Uh, I haven't seen my, my family, my extended family in Egypt for a very long time. Um, because at the time there was the revolution as well in 2011 and that was taking place. So, Things were, you know, things weren't kind of calmed down in Egypt until like 2012 because there was an elected president. Um, but 
I have summer friends that I go see every month who live in the same estate that I know and they're in the same situation as, as I am. Um, and they were shot in 2013 in the protests. And, and for me, that just didn't make sense. It didn't add up. I didn't care who was in power. And, you know, I, I got attacked on the Late Late Show for saying, you know, oh, we were at the cinema um, and then we ended up in a protest. But for me, kind of saying that, it was kind of just to give people a brief idea of how things were so normal two days before it. Um, you know, it wasn't like a, an event that, oh, let's, we walked out of the cinema on a protest. No, I'm saying that the same place that I was at the cinema in, it was, there was a protest the next day. So if Don Drum Cinema, you know, you, you watch a movie yesterday and a protest takes place, you're explaining of how easy and calming the situations were. Um, but when my friends were shot, I understood that, no, something's not adding up. Something for me as a young lad is you can't shoot people. Um, for simply calling for the rights, even if you're against it, even if you're if you don't believe in it, and and that's where I kind of needed to stand up and say, no, I'm I'm from a democratic background. I know this. I've been taught this my whole life. I know what democracy is, and I know what a ballot box is, and people who put their vote in. It. That's all I know about voting. It's simple. Walk up to the box, put your vote in, and a person comes to power. But if I want someone to be removed from power, it's the people's choice. It's not the army's choice. It's not the military's choice. And unfortunately enough, in kind of like in the Middle East and in the Arab world, and that's what that's why the Arab uprising happened because the military was you so rooted in power that it just wanted to control. And even when I was speaking to the officers in pri inside prison, they were always like, "It's our country. We're the ones who give blood. We're the ones who fight in the field." Yes, but you've chosen that job to serve and protect your people. And that was kind of the reason you chose that specific job, not for you to take power by force. And hence why, I, you know, I protested peacefully. Um, I went through trial for four years without being convicted of any crime. No evidence was given against me. And I'm sorry, like if Egypt arrested me, they, they would have provided evidence if there was no against me. There, there, there is no like common sense in them not providing evidence and then just releasing me after four years. It would even at least make their image look like, oh, he did a crime, so he's serving his time. But like, no, he's going to go through a mass trial with four years and we're not going to release him. Mm -hmm. So it, it just spoke volumes of the judicial system in Egypt. And I got a lot of, like, I got a lot of backlash for that because, you know, um, a lot of people were saying, um, Oh, the Muslim, he's part of the Muslim Brotherhood, or he's part, I was part of no organization. And, you know, I felt very sad that I had to sit on the Late Late Show and just define myself that I'm not part of any organization. I'm not lying. I am who I am. I'm a 17 year old who took part because I seen something so simple. It's like kind of like the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, when people kind of cover it up with, um, oh, everyone in America are looters and, you know, they're all robbing stores and no, there's no protesters out on the street. It was kind of exactly the same. They were, they were, you know, not like I'm not comparing two groups, but I'm just saying that it's the situation people were putting me in, that Ibrahim was committing violence. No, certainly because some people were doing something that I wasn't part of them. There was a larger scale mm. that people wanted democracy in Egypt. And if you read and if you are, you know, are you, you are following up what's happening in the Middle East and the Arab, Arab countries, you understand that these power people are willing to give up their life just for just for voting and, and just for you know to have their voice heard and uh, you know free education free health care they want that they they need a country because if you go there you you can see yeah the amuse the amusement parks you can see the beautiful scenery in the tourist places but when you go down to the slums in the country it's horrible and people are suffering people are dying from corona because you know no hospitals want to accept when they don't want to deal with it um even there was there was a just a famous video of a guy who was one of the biggest supporters uh, of CC who was um, at the time and he came out and he said my mom died of corona I'm dying of corona and I regret ever supporting you and he was you know he was given out because he was so frustrated from the situation that Egypt has reached such a stage uh, I'm, I wasn't in support of any president I didn't say this guy or this guy I said if I'm supportive of democracy that's what I know back home and that's you know democracy wasn't only made for Ireland democracy is the method that we followed and it should be brought around all around the world for everyone to live in peace and I couldn't understand why that was such a crime for me to kind of uh, speak to people about it and, and you know let's contemplate let's understand each other why can't we just live in peace why can't people choose who they want to stay in power and who, who to be removed from power why does it need to be forced upon us and that was kind of why why I paid my time for that and so, so talk to me about the, the actual protest and the events that led to you getting arrested and, and what followed from there. Um, so in 2013, um, I arrived in Egypt, like I said, I went out with my friends. I didn't know what was going on. Um, 
I remember even my sister t- talking to me at the time about protests, and I said, "I'm not, I'm not interested." Like I just came out with the leave and said, "I want to relax, it, uh, relax from my exams." Like, um, and it was Fatima as well. You know, I keep telling her that. I keep saying, "Remember that time you spoke to me?" Like how I, I was so naive. I didn't understand what was going on in the world. Um, but like I said, people started taking to the streets around uh, 30th of June, and. I just kind of started to listen to the people of Egypt. You know, you go down to coffee shops, you see people speaking about it. Um, it's a very, it's a very warm feeling when you go down to coffee shops in Egypt. You can just talk to anyone, um, and that was that. That kind of, kind of made me feel comfortable, where I can just go down, you know, sit with my friends, talk, and we were doing that. And they started to explain to me that you know, there's this guy in power, there's this uh, military that wants to take over. And and then you know they started protesting, and then they were shot dead um, with all the, the 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 number of people that were shot dead in the start. And I was I went out bawling, crying. I remember that night very well. And my sisters were crying, and we were just like we were just home, and we were saying like we were speaking to our mom because my mom flew over because she knew it, was, it wasn't like too safe, so she needed to hold us until we we come back uh, and book our tickets back. And she she stayed with us in our living room at the time, and, and we started crying. We said, "Mom, like, why is this happening? Like, it, it never happens. Why why is it such a crime for people to kind of like, you know, um, ask for for such a simple right, and they need to be killed for it?" And we were we were so devastated that night. Um, and like like I would say, we still recall it. Um, we still recall it to this day. Um, but yeah, sorry, and then. Um, and then I took down to the streets to protest to say that this is wrong. I'm going to be flying back to uh, back to Ireland. But as a person of experience of democracy and knowing that you can live in peace under democracy and that the larger people choose who to 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 get in power and you can still live happily ever after without any you know without any clashes without any uh, killing without any oppression and that's exactly what my crime was um, to, to the Egyptian government at the time or the you know i don't like to call them the government but let's speak political terms they they are the you know overpowered government at the time and i i was in the streets and then they started shooting so much people like i was i was i can still picture it right now i was i was standing in the street me and my sisters and we ran to the side and people were just dropping like literally just dropping 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 and everyone started running back and we were like okay where are we going to run where is the safest place because we know that we were surrounded around the whole area and, we, and they locked the train station. They didn't let anyone leave. Um, and my sister Fatima was the first to run in the mosque. So Fatima ran into the mosque and then I ran after her straight away with my other sisters. And all I cared, all I was caring about at that moment was, you know, I need to bring my sisters to safety. I don't care like how, but that needs to happen. Um, and then suddenly we all go into the mosque and all the protesters go into the mosque. And here's me again, being naive, thinking that this is a place of worship. Like, no matter how much, you know, political clashes happen, no, place, places of worship are sacred. And there's a series of events where I constantly am so naive and such a 17-year-old that, you know, I keep thinking, like, for example, that, you know, I haven't committed a crime. Let's protest peacefully. Um, let's hide in the mosque. Um, it's sacred. They, sh- they won't attack us. Let's go through trial. Um let's go to the prosecutor's office. I haven't committed a crime. He will let me out. You know, even if the police system are corrupt, the judicial system won't be corrupt because they're meant to, you know, they've worked so hard to reach to the position they are in to be a judge and to kind of, you know, um, you know, provide people fairness. And and that wasn't happening and provide people justice. And we were all locked up in the mosque for the the army, the military. And um, they were all, they were all combined with thugs. So they were working with thugs. And I'll explain to you that later on, I met a lot of those thugs in prison. And, I, you know, they were saying we were protesting. Um, the military offered us um, drugs and they gave us weapons and, um, and money to attack you guys. Um, and if we did not give the weapon back, we were arrested. So a lot of them just ran off with the money and the drugs and, you know, they didn't come back and they were arrested again. And that's why I met them in prison. And I understood all of this system later on. I, I didn't know any of this. I just thought, you know, they, these people want to hurt us. They just don't like us. Um, and the mosque shut the doors. They, they, they closed the door on us and they cut all water from, there was a tap inside the mosque. They cut water. Um, and they cut, um, they, they didn't provide us with any food whatsoever. Um, and they didn't provide us with any medical care because there were people who were injured, who, who were shot, who ran straight to, um, to the mosque. 
um, I remember even I had I had filmed an, I, I had grabbed an iPad um, and I was broadcasting for Al Jazeera because I wanted to show that we are, you know, there's none of us in the mosque that have any weapons and there's none of us that are harmful and this is all happening to us. And um, there was a lady who, they shot tear gas in a small room beside the mosque, so they were two connected. And that lady suffocated uh, to death and I filmed her. Like, I, I, I still remember to this day, I, I put the iPad on her and I said, look at this, like all she needed to save her from the suffocation was an injection because, you know, tear gas, it's illegal. And like, even me being naive, the first time I ran into tear gas, I, you know, I, I was running into tear gas and everyone's running back. And I said, like, why is everyone running back? Like, it's only tear gas. It's meant to only make you cry. Like, I only thought that's what tear gas does. But it burns you. It burns your eyes. It burns your skin. And you cannot breathe. You can die literally from just taking it in, consuming it. Um... And I was fil filming all of this, and then they shot electricity, so the iPad, I couldn't charge the iPad. And the minute that electricity shot and the iPad uh, shut down, um, they attacked the mosque. They shot bullets into the mosque, um, and they shot tear gas into the mosque. So you can imagine that, you know, a closed area, and they're shooting tear gas into a closed area, and they have control of the doors. So you purposely are going to die there. Um, all the protesters started pushing the doors open. They wanted to get out, pushing the doors open. And they were prepared. So they had um, a square of um, police um, soldiers uh, serving time, uh, serving army time. So they were, they were there and they had weapons uh, pointed at us. And you had to get down to the ground. It was like, you know, it's like exactly what you see in like happening between Israel and Palestine. It's exactly just weapons pointed at us for no reason, and then we all went out. I I got shot a bullet at that moment in my hand, and I was bleeding, and I didn't know where my sisters were because I couldn't breathe. The mosque was, you know, it was full of tear gas. Um, my sisters ran out of the mosque, and they said their part where they were, you know, they were sexually harassed. They they were grabbed from parts of their body they, from all the thugs that were outside. Remember, I told you there was thugs outside the mosque, so they were just grabbed by so many people, and. I didn't know where they were. I thought they were they were either dead or they just disappeared. I, I didn't know. And I was taken, um, and I was taken out to the street, and I was left there. And uh, and then he, he the, the officer hit me with the back of his uh, AK forty seven, and he said, "Stay there." So I stayed there for like half an hour, and then they put me into the tank. And after the tank, um, came a, a, like a high ranked officer, and he said to me, um. Uh, who, who are you? And I said to him, oh, I'm Ibrahim. I have this. Uh, this is my Irish passport because I had my Irish passport because that's the only identification. I had my Irish passport and I had the Institute of Education ID um, in Leeson Street. These were the only two IDs I had. Um, and, you know, he said, oh, so you're an Irish citizen? I said, yes. And he said, do you speak Arabic? So obviously, you know, I didn't, I didn't think it was a crime to say that I speak Arabic. And I said, yes, I speak Arabic. The minute I said I speak Arabic, he closed the door. As if it's like, oh, well, you speak Arabic, then you're not really an Irish citizen. You're also one of us, so we can, you know, we can abuse you too. So he closed the door. I was put from that uh, police, uh, from that army tank, I was, I, I was taken and put into a police van with about 30 to 35 people um, at that time. And it was the hottest weather in Egypt. And, you know, it's all metal and everyone's breathing and we, we couldn't breathe. And then they drove off with us into the desert, um, into a military camp. Um, and I don't want to take like too long going into Tita because it's four years, but this is where I first encountered my sisters and, you know, they just said, we're, we need you for five minutes and we're going to do a security background check. And again, I am naive and I say, okay, I have nothing. I've never committed a crime, security background check, and then we'll let you go. Because sometimes between the protesters, there can be bad people. And I said, definitely. Um, but all you know is that we were thrown into a cell. I see my sisters, um, but I can't see my third sister, Sumaya. Uh, and I start crying because all I think about is that she's dead. Like she got shot and she's dead. So I start crying and I say, listen, I need to see my sister. I need to know where she is. At least I can go home and tell my dad something. At least I can tell my parents something. And, um, geez, this is all coming back. Um, and then she, you know, we were all crying. They were in front of me with other women as well. I think there was about 50, 60 women. All the women were released, but because we said that we are Irish citizens, we remained. Because, you know, it has brought to us by many sources, and I don't want to mention the names, that Sisi wanted to negotiate some sort of deal with the president at the time in the Taoiseach. 
you know, I'll hand you back your citizens and you provide me such. And that's how politics work. I'm sorry. That, you know, that's that's how it works back in the Middle East. That's how it works in Arab countries. That's how it always, you know, they take prisoners and they negotiate for something. It's It's been a strategy for, for humans forever. Um, and I was meant to be presented on the process but I wasn't even presented on the prosecutor uh, until four days. So I should be so I should be arrested and presented on the prosecutor. And if he wishes to renew me four days, he renews me it renews for me four days uh, under under you know under trial. Um, but I was imprisoned four days, and then I was renewed the prosec- I was renewed fifteen days on the prosecution, which leaves me to ask where was the first day where, where I was meant to be presented on prosecutor. So I was meant to be presented on the first, and then on the fourth. And then again after the second, mm. first fifteen, and, and so on. But I wasn't even presented on the first. Yeah, I, rec- the, I recall I was, there were so many collapsed trials or trials that never happened. There were so many. Yeah, there so many just, present. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There were so many illegal, you know, illegal things that were being done. And I suppose in the background was the kind of foreign affairs dynamics around uh, Egypt being under scrutiny for human rights in the European Union, and then. I don't know, there was talk of like beef and uh, beef export deals between Ireland and Egypt and so on. But I mean, we, we could get, get pulled into all of that. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of mindful also that at the same time, there were certain people in Ireland creating other stories around all of this, weren't there? There were like yeah, es- yeah. essentially what you might call a smear campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there was people definitely who were, you know, like I remember the first time the controversy of... Uh, Ibrahim ripped up his Irish passport, um, which I, I like. You know, if you have if you have a car to save you, or if you have a boat to save you, you're not going to sink the boat for absolutely no reason. Uh, my Irish passport was the only identification and the only thing to prove that I'm Irish, and the only thing that I can provide to the prison authorities um, that I'm Irish, because even my sisters didn't have any identification at them at the time, and um, because we were just all robbed. We were, you know, imagine imagine being sexually harassed. So if you're sexually harassed, they're not going to rob you personally. Um, but I kept my my passport. It was the only thing safe. I remember I had the iPhone 4s at the time, and that was that was robbed. My money was robbed, but I had to keep onto my passport because I knew that was that was the thing that was going to save me. Um, and you know, after the prosecutor, after the four days, the prosecutor, we met up with the prosecutor. He didn't allow us to see a lawyer. He didn't allow us to see the the, the embassy at the time. And you know, he said he put a sheet in front of me and he said, "These are 19 charges against you." And he, I said to him, like, I, I laughed, like, hysterical. I just, I went into hysteria. Like, I, I started saying, like, murder, um, attempted murder, robbing the tank. Like, the period of the protest was so short that you couldn't even commit all of those crimes if you wanted to. Like, murdering 210 people. Like, that's on a whole nother level. Um, and then after that, burning and robbing a tank and robbing stores or whatever, they just created the list and they handed it to the 500 people. Um, you know, I was speaking to one of the lawyers and I was telling them how funny it is because during the mosque, uh, during when we were in the mosque, they opened in front of their media, they opened a safe passage for everyone to be released, right? Uh, if you're going to open a safe passage and you're calling that everyone in the mosque is a criminal, well, if you're opening a safe passage, it's very likely that the criminal walks out in a safe passage. I think we see this in movies and we see this everywhere where the criminal just walks out between the people. But the thing is, like, I went out to see that safe passage and all the thugs gathered around me. I said to him, how do you, I said to the officer at the time, how do you expect me to bring out my sisters and they're just going to be sexually harassed in this environment? Um, and then that's later on, straight away, they attacked. Um, so what I'm saying is I attached my passport to that. Uh, he said, I need your Irish passport to identify that you are Irish and for you to get consular visits and also to prove that you are underage um, because I don't have any identification for you to prove that you're underage. And he stapled it to my file. And that was the last I seen on my passport. And it popped out of nowhere that Ibrahim burned his passport. Like, you know, if Ibrahim chewed away, if Ibrahim done something, no, Ibrahim burned his passport. Ibrahim is doing... And it was very sad and it killed me, to be honest, because I was in a cell there thinking that, you know, I'm doing what Irish people taught me. I'm doing what I've learned my whole life. Stand up for people who are being oppressed. Stand up for those who need who need a voice. And I don't regret it. And I won't ever regret it. And you know, if the whole world stands against me, Rory, I won't regret it. But it was just so sad to see that. You get me? I'm, I'm 18 or 19 in a cell. Uh, celebrating all the celebrations of my birthday away from my family, away from my country. And I don't even feel like I am Egyptian at the time because you you get me, I only go to Egypt for summer holidays. 
I never really understood the culture or the people or who they are until I started living with them in those cells. So there I am feeling like, why is everyone back home thinking that I'm like that? And, you know, as much as there's great support and there was enormous support, but it's those little things that hurt you when you're, you're doing something good. And I think you've seen it on Twitter. You've seen that, you know, no matter how much you do, people just, they just always give their horrible opinion. Yeah, I guess there was certainly a, a, a distinct current of Islamophobia creeping through. And there, there seemed to be like a conflation around the role of your father who... I don't, I don't know the full detail, but it seems like he's relatively prominent as a cleric. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, so my father is the imam of the Klonsky Mosque. Mm -hmm. But even that, like, to be honest, like, Rui, really, you, you're doing a podcast. So when I come judge you, I judge you based on the work you've done. I don't say Rory's father course, yeah. done this. It, it, it's, it's what you've created for your own self. I'm, I was 17 at the time. I didn't get to create a legacy for myself. I didn't create any, any path for myself yet. I was still scraping onto my road. And, you know, there are all these people attacking me based on this or based on this guy. Or, you know, when I was on the Late Late Show, they found a very far guy to bring up on, uh, uh, to attack me with. Uh, and it's, there's no linkage between me and him. But it's just that, you know, Ibrahim Halawa, he's not white. And I'm going to be honest and straightforward about it. You're not white. You're not blonde. Uh, you don't have blue eyes or colored eyes. I'm sorry, you can't be Irish. Because we are the first, like my generation, we're kind of the first mostly appearing generation of like, you know, you can be Irish and brown. So it was very new. And I understand that there was this culture shock to people. But you don't have to be hateful about it. You don't have to be bitter about it. And that was, was very sad because, you know, I grew up and constantly like that wasn't only, that didn't only appear after prison. Like I said, constantly growing up, it was always go back home, go back to your country, go back to your country, go back to your country. And it's, it's my country. I was born here. But come on, like, okay, I'm the first generation, second generation of, like, our, our people. Um, but, like, my nieces and nephews, like, this is 25 years later. They're born here, and they're being told. She came the other day to her mom, and she said, I was in school, and, and someone told me, go back to your country. Like, when is this going to become, ex like, when is this even going to end? Hmm. And it's, how, it's how, young are those, how young is the nie your niece and... She, she's she's eight she's nine my niece is like the biggest my biggest nephew is 10 and and she's getting that from other children who are sure, other obviously children. picking it up from from parents their parents stuff. exactly like i don't get it like we, we're the ones who created borders but not only that we're creating it's exactly like when i was in prison I, I used to always tell my fellow prisoners they've taken our freedom and they built walls let's not build our own walls within ourselves you know, we've created borders all around the world, but why are we creating these human borders that are not even visible? Mm. We're just putting them there in place for us to find excuses to hate each other, to abuse each other, to kill each other, to take power, you know, for petrol, for, for many reasons, for money, for gold. We're just killing and killing and killing and abusing. And that's, that wasn't me. And I'm not going to be like that ever. You know, and people called me uh, names. On, let, let's let's speak honest about it. People called me names like a terrorist or, you know, he's a ticking bomb and wait until this guy comes back and wait until this, this guy. I'm sorry, like, when the time came for all the ISIS people, they all fled to Syria to fight. You know, it's it's been it's been three years and I'm still here and there's still nothing. And I'm still, you know, I, w I went on, I got a job, I found myself a job. I um, I started college and I'm studying law because I want to help and I want to change and I will continue to do that. People, those negative comments do nothing but motivate me because I have also a lot of people who support me and say great things and understand that, you know, you can be Irish and you can be brown. You can be um, Irish and, you know, you don't have to look a certain look or um, be a certain color or speak a certain way. You, there's no, these little specifics that we put onto the, you know, onto your CV of being Irish. Like, why are we putting them there? And I don't want to see my kids or my nephews or nieces suffer that because it, it, it was very painful. It was very painful as a kid when I'm, you know, trying to, trying to become one of the other kids in school and then some guy makes a joke of you and everyone in the class starts laughing and, you know, go back to your country or you're a packy. It's always been there. It hasn't changed. And I received it more in prison. And to be honest, like, when I talk about it, I say that I, the Islamophobia that appeared, I got it the most because I was the most person in the spotlight in Ireland as a Muslim at the time. 
So I received that. It has nothing to got to do about my case. Yes, people are using my case as an excuse to bring out the bitterness in them. But the bitterness is in, because they're not attacking Ibrahim. They're attacking, you know, uh, Islam or they're attacking oh, his Irishness. But they weren't attacking the details of the case. Because if we came and sat down, me and him, and spoke facts about the case that I was in, there's legal papers, there's legal documentation, there's proof that I did nothing, there was witnesses that I did nothing. If someone goes into trial in Ireland and he's proven innocent after four years without a trial, without any witness, without evidence, he can sue the country for, you know, for, for, for uh, incarceration. So, but so when, you do, when, when you're spending all this time in prison, Abraham, and, and you're aware of, of some of this, uh, what's going on in the background, and there's a continual flow of cases not proceeding and like almost false hopes emerging, how did you maintain a sense of hope and not actually fall into a despair? To be honest, I, ha I have to say, um, first of all, my family, um, you know, also I'm a, I believe in God. So um, I was kind of my strength worship. And I always say this, like, if you don't ever believe in God and you go into prison, believe in something because you need to, you know, you need to speak to someone. You need to speak to something um, to kind of just let it out there. But I started writing and I, I always go by a quote. It says, you know, that. You know, people cry tears, um, but um, but writers cry, you know, they cry ink. And um, I love that because I can just explain um, explain my my feelings and my situation. And, right, and I always say that, like, at the time, it, I was just out of English paper one and English paper two. And I just did, you know, I wasn't a writer and I didn't know how to write, but I enjoyed them. And I, and I started reading more. I started speaking to people as well because when you see someone drowning, right, um, or when you see someone in a problem, you can you can direct them from shore. You can tell them where the shore is, but when they're drowning, they only have one thing that they want to do, and they want to they want to know how to breathe. They want to get up to the surface and grab a breath. But you're telling them the way out. So when you see people, when people tell you their problem, you can help them. And sometimes you see your own problem by helping them. Um, you sometimes listen to them and say, oh, I feel similar and I think this should be done. So when you give them the solution, you feel that, oh, this also applies to me, so I should do it. Uh, and we were sharing that. We, you know, you're with people 24-7 in a cell. I think that you'd find everything to speak about. Also, like I said, my sisters, the Irish people definitely uh, helped. Um, you know, the Irish government helped, I'm going to say in the second half. I'm not going to say in the first half. Uh, um, like, I have to give credit to the people who helped. Um, and even if there is political differences, even if that doesn't that doesn't mean that I neglect the right for them helping me, uh, I wouldn't be a, a good human being if I did that just because you know I have political differences. Um, Lynn Boylan as well, Lynn Boylan, like she's my hero. Um, I look up to her, and still she's like an older sister to me. If I have a problem, I go to her and I say to her, Lynn, like I'm having this problem or I'm suffering. And my lawyer, Dara Kenny, as well. I say to him, you know, he he gives me so much advice. He checks up on me regularly. These are the people that kind of like definitely, definitely um, kept me going when I was inside, especially when Lynn visited me in prison. I just felt like, you know, the Taoiseach doesn't want to do that. No one wants to do that. And here's this lady with my lawyer risking her life to come see me in prison. Like, this gives you some sort of hope, no matter what. Um, also writing letters. Um, people wrote letters to me a lot. Um, a lot of them were confiscated, um, birthday cards, they were confiscated. But I, knowing that I'm receiving that much support was just very helpful. And that's why I always say, let's support people that are in need. Um, when people were jumping, you know, uh, on, on, the, on the Black Lives Matter um, protest and saying, you know, um, it's not fair. Um, this happens in Palestine. This, I'm saying, I said, you know, I, I wrote this on Twitter and I wrote this on Instagram. It's, it's not fair it's that we neglect the black people mourning their problem. They, they have the right to mourn. They have the right to feel pain. It's been going on for so long. We need to support them at the time. It doesn't mean that Palestine doesn't happen anymore. It says, you know, there's so much problems happening on in the world. We need to tackle each problem. But when it's time for as humans, we need to break that barrier that, okay, I'm only specialized in this case and I'm only going to help this case and I'm only going to... That's not that's not your your job as a human. Your your job as a human to help everyone in need at any time. 
And do you feel that um, we're in this kind of new moment of race and reckoning uh, right now? Do you feel optimistic about that? Do you feel like things are, are you know, out of all the injustice and, and the, the protest and, and the sense of, uh, how would you say, uh, maybe like there could be a fatigue emerging from the Trump era, but, but certainly like the uprising of peaceful predominantly peaceful protests do you, do, you, do you get a sense of energy from that and hope yeah i do uh, to be honest and it feels great that like we can finally speak about this and i think when it raises when, when it rises to the surface and kind of we can say that this is happening we feel that we can finally breathe and say that you know guys this has been going on for very long yes now there's people dying from it and it's become clear to you but let's educate ourselves and that was kind of the thing that i liked about people owning the narrative this time you know uh, in the black lives matter protests the number one um thing that everyone was saying was educate yourself educate yourself educate it's not bad that if i don't know something about a certain situation or if i don't understand how people are feeling that i go read about it that i go understand their perspective and if i don't agree with it i say respectfully why i don't agree with it i don't have to be hateful i don't have to be bitter i don't have to be aggressive i don't that you know we have to let people live we have to let people um like ireland has become ireland has changed over the last you know um 20 years that I've been, 25 years that I've been alive, like we're, you know, it was a very religious state, you know, and we've become very left and we've come, become very open and we've become very understanding um, to many, many people. And I, I love that. And I love that people are starting to understand that are people are being abused because of their race. There's people being abused because number one, two, and three. And we should bring this to schools. It shouldn't be only on Twitter. It shouldn't only be on, you know, um, I remember at the time, my when I was in primary school, it was it was give racism the red card, and that was you know I, I would have liked to see that follow up and that move on forward and people kind of listen to that, but people had to die for people starting to listen, and that, us humans only start moving when people start dying because of what we see on social media. Death has become so normal. What we see on uh, social media, abuse has become so normal. Oppression has become so normal, and we need to understand that it's not normal. And for me, kind of like. You know, it was like, it's exactly the same. When I was in prison at the start, hearing people scream and being tortured was the worst thing for me. But then later on, you can like, you're going to have to live your life and you're going to have to adapt and, and just, you know, live because constantly you're hearing people scream and being tortured. But I was always reminding myself that this is not normal. If I was eating and someone started, you know, getting tortured outside, I would leave my food. Even though I wasn't like, I wasn't being affected, but I needed my brain to understand that this is not normal. And I will not accept that whatsoever. I would sit in the corner, I would tell people, like, let's stop eating. A guy is suffering, no matter what his crime is, no matter what, he shouldn't be suffering as a human. Taking one guy's freedom is enough. It's enough pain. Here, he's away from his family. I don't have to beat him. I don't have to torture him. I don't have to electrocute him. I don't have to whip him. Just to, for what? To prove that I have some power and authority? Um, but like I said, in the end of the day, Ireland has become very open to these discussions and we've become very open to have these panels and i like that and i like seeing so many people being supportive and you know we're dominating that hateful voice and we're taking over that and we need to own our own narrative and explain to people that you know you can't say that you can't say the n-word even if it's it's in good terms or even you can't say it. it's wrong and it's not acceptable you can't say slurs like you know it was always said to us like we're growing up you're packy you can't say that anymore it's not normal People need to feel like if you're saying that you will be caught out, you'll be caught out on video. Back in the day, there was no video, there was no social media. But I'm sorry, I will, I will put you on social media if you're doing that because you need to understand them. You need to be, um, uh, you, you need to learn your lesson. Yeah, I suppose like it, where it gets very deadly serious is for all human beings, but particularly when you think of your eight-year-old niece, that all children being equal and and never having a, a choice in life to to go any direction and suddenly they're being affected by all of this hate that that is flowing and i think like there, there are many positive dimensions to social media but certainly i think we'll all agree that we both agree that there, there are a lot of um a lot of negativity and a lot of darkness around social media that i suppose can be challenging to navigate i mean how do you at the moment are you just someone who blocks everything or how do you kind of regulate no. a lot of that I have a different perspective to that. Like, um, I don't, I don't run away from problems. I need to solve them. 
Um, and, you know, even if I'm having a discussion with my sister and it kind of gets heated or, you know, normal discussions with people, I always say, let's talk it out because just keeping it in the back of your mind is not going to solve it. It's going to, you know, it's going to trigger. And I think this quarantine made us realize, realize that once we have a lot of time, a lot of things from the back of our mind start popping up, start memories, start problems that we, we, we had at, at, at a certain stage. Um, and I believe like they never get resolved until you resolve them, until you know how to deal with them. Um, it's you know, I, re- I read something where it was explaining that when problems appear to you, it's not it's not learning how to you know overcome it or how ha- no, it's learning how to deal with it. Once it happens and it's appeared to you, the next time you have to learn how to deal with it, so it wouldn't hurt you, it wouldn't harm you. Some people feel that it's okay to block it and it's okay just to, and I'm okay with that. Like if you see someone hateful on Twitter, it's good to block people. Um, and sometimes I engage in necessary um, engagements on Twitter just to prove to the people you know, this is this is the systematic racism that happens. This is the systematic oppression that happens. Not because I want to engage in it, um, but I understand that. But I always take care of myself, and that's number one. And I, I'm starting to advocate a lot uh, on men's mental health. Um, for me, that's number one. Uh, we've always been raised, you know, you stop crying, be a tough bloke, take it like a man. Um, you know, even kids around you, you know, if you're not strong enough, you, you don't fit in. No, a man a man has every right to cry a man has every right to grieve a man has every right to feel pain and if we if we feel pain in our stomach we take you know we take medication if we take it if we feel pain in our arms or numbness we take medication but when it comes to the pain of the brain we somehow neglect it and it's like illegal for us to acknowledge that there's something wrong there and we need to take medication for it whether it's legal whether it's help professionally uh, or whether you feel something that you find comfort in like exercise or whether it's reading or whether it's writing but you need to figure out that i'm doing this because i need to solve some issue i need to tackle this problem to overcome it because especially for us men um and i've i've spoken to a lot of guys about this that once they start to feel that there's a mental health problem with them they neglect it and after them neglecting it they start to rise in other problems in relationship problems uh in in problems with their kids they're very aggressive they don't want to listen they don't want to and you think that it's oh i'm very stressed or oh i've had a hard day in work it's not it's your brain your brain is tired out and you're not giving everyone the right you're not giving your wife or your girlfriend or your friend or you're not giving them your right of time or you know just nice words and kind because you constantly feel lonely you constantly feel sad you constantly feel down and that's okay to acknowledge that that's something you know wrong with me uh, um sorry there, there, that, that, that there's 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 a mental problem with me that i need right. to fix yeah, yeah. I do, I do, it's interesting you bring this up because i don't feel like these two uh, situations are exclusive you know the 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 emergence of a lot of hate and division and toxicity ultimately. And then this kind of problem that many of us men, and I include myself in this, that we've grown up in a particular type of culture, whether it be Christian or Muslim or many other Mm. different traditions, um, Mm -hmm. where men haven't always had the space or support to delve into the emotional realm, which ultimately the worst case scenario that we see is a high prevalence of suicide, particularly in young men. So there's absolute evidence there. But I wonder that that idea that we don't have the space and support or don't, don't open up to it, to receiving it also, that if it's not harnessed and it's, it doesn't end up in addiction or despair or suicide depression, it can also end up being channeled into toxic political narrative that it finds an energy flow in That's trying to process itself through through this kind of hatred thing that allows you to externalize your problems onto somebody else and say that it's Abraham or the Muslims or the Christian (laughs) or the gay people or the Cavan people or the Limerick (laughs) people or the Kala people. Kala. Yeah, that's uh, that's very true. It is. It is. We, 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 you know, we're, excuse and that's exactly what i mean like you need to tackle that problem before you bring it on to any other people uh, i mentioned relationships you mentioned political you know systems and that's very very true like we we find this space to kind of just become hateful for an absolutely no reason when we have a problem that we need to, to solve ourselves 
Yeah, I, I, I feel like a lot of, I want to play some Bob Marley now. This is like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like, um, I, I guess like I've always been drawn to reggae music for that reason in, in, as a young person uh, when, when I was growing up. Um, I felt like reggae music spoke to that oppression and injustice in the world. But at the same time, they were able to navigate it and uh, articulate it through this idea of one love you know yeah that let's get together and feel all right so yeah i mean i think that's i think no matter what i love that vibe about you to be honest <laughs> <laughs> well you know it is the love and courage podcast so and uh you know i i, I do i i um I, I i kind of um i zoned in on that on the word love and courage after actually speaking to uh uh an Oireachtas committee uh oh, i was a long time ago it was um it could have been 10 or 15 years ago, um, I was giving a presentation to a bunch of TDs and senators on, on alcohol harm and drug harm. And because a lot of my background is in kind of youth development work. And I remember going away going, they kind of agree with me. I know they agree with me, but mm. a lot of them aren't going to do anything about it, you know? And I feel like there was a, like a, there's a political disconnect from the idea of a loving society and, and standing for love. And then mm -hmm. the thing that we need to manifest that is the courage and the leadership and to speak out. And so to, to kind of reframe life in the language of love. And I think there can be a difficulty for lads and lad culture to even use the word love because it's seen as a female word. It is. That's very true. Whoa. It is. <laughs> And that's the thing, like, but well, I always, I always go by, by, you know, famous quote, he says, don't build your homes on people because once they start walking away um your home will be gone with them so i like i i love the way you built your own podcast that's your own home you know you wanted to change and that's what we need to start doing people feel that they're not confident enough to play their music on social media or you know or do certain things um, where they feel comfortable and advocate upon it we always expect people to do something for us and you know it's it's 2020 where it's not as much of a you know jinx to it is but there's still greatness within it this quarantine could have been great for so many people to contemplate to and um, realize that maybe their career path that they were following isn't them maybe they want to create a certain change or you know sometimes it's also okay to realize that no i needed a break from life like you know there's everything stopped wars kind of stopped or you know um they didn't stop fully but everything calmed down in life and that, the world needed to breathe the world really needed to breathe and and uh, i'm definitely an advocate of that own your own narrative own your own narrative and you know create your own change and i love the way you're doing that to be honest and I hope one day that I can do it. And that's why I'm starting to take my career, um, my legal career to kind of, you know, speak on behalf of oppressed people because, you know, speaking as a, a human rights activist is one thing, but once you're speaking their language and speaking legal terms, they start to understand you. And that's why I wanted to do that. I wanted to study law. So when I say, sorry, you're, you know, you're breaking the law because this and this and this and this, that's, that's what they need to listen to. Bring it on, Ibrahim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Listen, thanks so much for your time. And uh, I wish you a huge success in all your activism and in your work and in your studies. Having me. And, and I, I never got around to thank you about the tickets as well for, for Body and Soul. Oh, that's that? right. Yeah, yeah we, we were first <laughs> in touch a few years ago. Uh, you, you weren't too long out of prison, were you? When you went I wasn't. To Body was and Soul like, Festival. Like, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. It was, it was really nice to see that. Well, look at that. Uh, I think we all agree we need more festivals in the world. So hopefully when this pandemic is uh, contained and over, we'll get back to some celebrations and, and get more music out into the world. So thanks again, Ibrahim. Awesome. Thank you very much.